would want to travel anywhere these days? Take major security precautions overseas. All you hear about is war, disease, and conflict all around the world. I'm here to change the misconceptions of international travel. I know there's more behind the headlines. Here's your story, let's begin. The water's fine, come on, dive in. The future's here, it's right before your eyes. I'm Sharon Lee. And after having traveled to 79 countries around this amazing world, I've learned one thing for sure. We're not so different. With a smile and a curiosity to learn, I'm on a mission to find real people, real places, and have some real adventure. So join me as we're all part of the Culture Club. Every time I tell someone that I'm going to Africa, I always get the same response. Flies, drought, oh, and don't forget about the pirates. To stereotype such a magical place as Africa in such negative terms is just an injustice. With over 50 countries that make up Africa, it's hard to choose which country to visit first. I've heard a lot about Kenya, from the slums of Kibera all the way to the amazing safaris of the Maasai Mara. So I decided to check it out and see it for myself firsthand. Kenya borders Uganda and the Indian Ocean in the east part of Africa. Most people come here for the safaris and the animals. I'm excited to see that too, but I want to meet the real Kenyans. We're going to meet a local graffiti artist who calls himself Bank Slave and who's gained international attention through his provocative street art. We'll eat some local cuisine and who knows what kind of adventures we'll get into. That's the best part about this type of travel. You just never know what's around the corner. When I arrived in Kenya, I could feel the excitement in the air as the country was getting ready for their 50th anniversary of independence from British control. I talked to some people on the streets and they expressed what that means to them. So at 50, we have a lot to celebrate. We have to celebrate freedom. Because those days we were 50 years, mm -hmm. uh, around the line is when we got our, our what? Our freedom. Freedom, yes, yes, exactly. And it has brought in a lot. Of course it has been good mm -hmm. and bad, yeah. but we look at the good. After talking to the locals, I jumped into a cab and headed over to meet Bank Slave. So this place is amazing. I mean, the, there's so much expression in this studio. I love the, the view of Nairobi. This is incredible. What a great spot to be a, to do your work. So what motivates you the most to do, like to go out in the streets and really paint from your heart? What motivates you to do what you do and, and, uh, and why? You know, where I come from in Kibera, you know, we have like a lot of people living there and it helps you grow faster. And there's a lot of things that happen, you know, you want to, to teach coming generations, you know, and that really motivates me, you know, me knowing that I have the talent. A lot of Bank Slave's work has to do with political unrest and bringing a voice to the people of Kenya. He wanted to show me one of his favorite pieces that he'd done on the streets, but unfortunately, due to its controversial images, the government painted over it. What? part of the world. It was like a long stretch of it. And they took it down? Yes. Why? Um, I, I, I have no idea, but maybe someone was angry about it. After hearing his story behind this piece, I really wanted to see his artwork where it was meant to be seen, on the streets. I love this. I like it too. It's, it's one of my best. Okay. One of my best pieces. What's the most important thing you want people to know about your work? Um, the most important thing is that, you know, we are Africans and we have this talent that we are, we are here to show the world. And graffiti can be used in a positive way just to change people, change the world. The ability to go out and just use paint to speak to the people and just make a world speak. After talking to Bank Slave and learning that he was from Kibera, I was interested in going to check it out myself. 
If you've heard anything about Kibera, you'll know that it's one of the largest slums in Africa, and the estimated population is around 1 million, but it's uncertain of the exact number because the people of Kibera have somewhat been forgotten. Kibera is extremely poor and lacking really basic services like running water and electricity. They call this place Chocolate City because when it rains, it gets really muddy. So you can see with this rain, we have a little bit of a chocolate river here going on. But it's a great place and we're about to go see an amazing story. If you're going to venture into areas like this, it's really important that you take a local with you who knows the area. Luckily, Bank Slave hooked me up with a guy named Jojo. Jojo and his parents run a center in Kibera called the Fruitful Talent Center. I'm sure you're wondering why I would want to go to a place like this. But after seeing the amazing talent from Bank Slave, I wanted to see what other diamonds in the rough that I could find. There's very little in terms of entertainment for children in the slums. The Fruitful Talent Center is a place where they can learn acrobatics, meet other kids, and watch TV. It's basically like the YMCA of Kibera. The idea is just to bring out the kids from the streets and make them know that uh, they have a family. Even though some of them are orphans, they have to know that they have a family. They have someone that they can rely on, and that is Fruitful Talent Center. With your acrobatic background, um, how did you encourage them to learn and uh, learn the acrobatics that you had? Most of the kids are small kids, so uh, it was uh, just an idea that we open uh, an early childhood development project and also it can also benefit the community a lot because some of the uh, people from the community are vulnerable and they can't afford to go to school. faces and knowing how proud they are to show me what they've learned, this place warms my heart and this is the stuff I live for. Most people around the world get their impressions about America through the news and media, so in all of my interactions with people, I always like to give them an opportunity to ask me anything about America and our culture. Jojo's only question to me was pretty funny. In America, do you have mud like this? Mud like the one? Mud, like Chocolate City? Uh, when it's raining here in Kenya, yeah, that's why we call it Chocolate City because <laughs> it rains and uh, uh, there is a lot of mud that looks like chocolate. <laughs> so, yeah, if I may ask that, uh, in your country, do you have mud? Yes, my, a lot of mud. A lot it of mud. looks similar to this in places in the mountains and in uh, near rivers and lakes. There's cities where we don't have so much mud, kind of like Nairobi City, where there's not too much mud. So, so uh, thank you, Asante Sana. Yeah. Thank you so much. After having so much fun watching the kids jump around, singing and playing, it's time to leave Kibera and get something to eat. Taxi cabs are the best way to get around Nairobi, and it's best to find one driver that you like, then use him for the rest of your trip. You'll always get the best deal that way because you can negotiate the rates from place to place by keeping the same guy. I took a taxi from Kibera to Karen to have some lunch. Karen is a nicer part of Nairobi, named after Karen Blixen from the 1985 movie Out of Africa. After about a 45 minute cab ride to Karen, I went to a local restaurant called the Tamasha Joint that specializes in Nyamachoma, which means roasted meat. general manager of the Tamasha joint and sat down with me to explain about all of the different side dishes and how the meat is prepared. <laughs> so here's the nyamachoma. Wow, so this is the first course, nyamachoma, which is in Buzi. That's Buzi. That's now which part of the goat's body is this? This is the, uh, uh, no, the front leg. Front leg. Because eating it, you should have some other complements, like now we have this mokimo. If you don't want it to be roasted, mm -hmm. it can be fried. It's kind of like a mixed vegetable. With this delicious corn, but it's very seasoned. With some mokimo. Mokimo, a little bit here. This is like a, a vegetable mixture. Like it's almost like it's a Cuisinart combination of a bunch of vegetables with deliciously seasoned onions. Mm. Mm. This mixed vegetables, delicious with big corn. 
Tusker is the official beer of Kenya, and there's nothing like a cold Tusker beer with some delicious roasted goat. Forget the Tusker. Don't forget about the Tusker. <laughs> That's the most ice cold and <laughs> dripping down. Great, thank you so much for showing me how to eat it. It looks delicious. After lunch at the Tamasha Joint, we left Karen and headed for the outskirts of Nairobi to visit the David Sheldrick Foundation. One of Kenya's main priorities is wildlife preservation, and we visited the David Sheldrick Foundation to see their amazing work in rescuing baby elephants that were left in the wild after poachers had killed their mothers. 22,000 elephants were illegally killed across Africa in 2012, which is slightly lower than the 25,000 elephants poached in 2011. These greed-fueled killings for the ivory tusks have left hundreds of abandoned baby elephants to fend for themselves. Some die in the wild, but fortunately, thanks to Dr. Dame Daphne Sheldrick, she has created this organization in honor of her late husband, David Sheldrick, to rescue and raise the abandoned babies until they're healthy enough to go back into the wild. As soon as they're old enough to survive on their own, the foundation releases them into the Savo National Park. I met the head keeper, Edwin, who's worked here for 14 years, and he told me that baby Basilinga was found next to her mother at just two weeks old. And unfortunately, his mother was killed by poachers. Oh, hi, Kingasha. Hi. Hi. Normally, no one is allowed to get into the pens with these baby orphaned elephants. But I worked my magic and my charm with Edwin, the head keeper, and got to go inside and pet and play with little Basilinga. So this is Basilinga. Yes. Oh, he's so cute. And you're Edwin. Yes, I am. Edwin, and you've been here 14 years. Yes, I've been Oh, my gosh. So you must love your job. Do you do. love being with the babies? I do. Yeah. I do. What's your favorite part about working with these guys? Well, my favorite part is seeing them uh, and learning how intelligent and how clever they are. Oh, I bet. Oh. Uh, because once you stay with them, they learn more about you, they respect you, they understand you. Yeah. And if you talk to them, they sort of like understand and listen oh. to what you are. So you feel like you're friends with them. You yeah. take like the parent. Yeah. Like you take over as the parent, yeah. which is you are. Yeah. Because you hand feed them. Yeah. You sleep next to them. You make sure they're safe. Yeah. So it's everything that a parent does. It does, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And provide them with all the care, the love, being with them very close every now and then. Wow. So they know this is a good person and so they want to be your friend. Oh. Yeah. This was my favorite part of this entire trip. I got to be in the pen with little baby Basilinga. Come here, Basilinga. Come here, my new best friend, baby, Basilinga. The best part about the David Sheldrick Foundation is once you've gotten to know an elephant like Basilinga, you can go home and adopt them and take care of them and raise them up until the point where they're released into the wild. And you do get weekly reports on the elephant's health and well-being. After falling in love with little baby Basilinga, I'm looking forward to seeing the elephants in the wild on my safari tomorrow in the Maasai Mara. But if you don't want to travel six hours to go to a tribal village, you can stay in Nairobi and visit the Bomas of Kenya. I'm at the Bomas of Kenya, here in Nairobi, Kenya. And this place was established in 1971 by the government to promote all the different tribes and villages and preserve the culture of Kenya across the country. Uh, we're also going to check out some villages the way they look, we're going to check out some tribes, talk to some people, and we're also going to listen to some music and dance, so let's take a look. What's interesting about the Bomas of Kenya is that they bring the tribes to the city with replicas of what you would see in the natural habitats so that you can learn about traditional dress, customs and meet a representative from each tribe. I first met with David from the Turkana tribe. He explained to me about the customs of his tribe, their nomadic lifestyle, and marriage practices. Tell me more about your Turkana tribe and a little bit about your traditions. I see that we're near the hut here, so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about your tribe, people, and how they live. It is temporary, whereby people are keeping on moving with animals mm -hmm. while they are looking for pasture and water. They are moving together with animals. Mostly cows or yeah, what kind cows, of animals? Cows, goats, sheep. Okay. Yeah. 
they are moving with them. So it's not a permanent hut. And we settle to some places. We just leave this traditional hut there. Then we come back again. We settle to some areas. After maybe during rainy season, we now move with the animals looking for pasture and water. And then we, we just construct it or we go to the same same place where we, we left the, the hut. So tell me what's in your hand. Uh, what is in my hand is for this one, a traditional seat. We seat. call it Ekcholong. Can you say it again? Ekcholong traditional. And the name? Ekcholong in Rukana. Okay. Yeah. What does it do? Uh, we use it for sleeping while we rest. Can you show me? While Give me an example. Sleep, while we are sleeping. Oh, can you, let me see. <laughs> oh, it's a chair. Yeah, it's a chair. <laughs> what fascinates me about these tribes is their ingenuity and creativity to adapt to their needs and surroundings. Can you help out? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And how do you say thank you in Turkana? Johonoi. Johonoi. Alakar. After thanking David for his time, I wanted to get a woman's perspective on her roles. I met with a representative from the Maasai tribe who used to live in the bush, but has now accepted a position with Bomas of Kenya to talk about her culture and ways. So I'm here at the Maasai hut. This is great. And I love all your jewelry and all the colors. And I want to talk about this jewelry because every Maasai has the most colorful, ornate jewelry. Can you tell me why and your culture that you have so many jewelry, earrings, the headpieces, and what it all means? The men can have many wives in this culture. So explain to me how it works. Do they take turns? How does it work in terms of the relationship? I was so comfortable and it became so informal that I felt like I was home talking to one of my girlfriends. We laughed and talked about the roles of the second and third wives and how the first wife's job is to cook and clean for the second and third wives. Do you get more nights with your husband because you're the first wife? More sex? No. More crack crack? Okay. No, no. <laughs> Masai, no, no. no, no. <laughs> okay. Only one and <laughs> I don't know about the benefits of that, but whatever. There was a lot more chatting with the help of an interpreter. And even though we didn't speak the same language, I felt connected to her woman to woman. After hearing about the Maasai tribe from my new friend, I got more excited about my trip tomorrow to the Maasai village. So back to the hotel for me to rest up for my six hour bus ride in the morning. Now this is what it's all about. Everybody comes to Africa for the safaris, and there is nothing like a game drive in the Maasai Mara Game Reserve here in Kenya. This is why people come from all around the world to enjoy Kenya's beauty. All of the animals, the big five, the safaris, there is absolutely nothing like it. The animals coexist together, lions, giraffes, cheetahs, elephants, all working together on this big, big space of land. While you're driving around, you can't help but notice the incredible sky of Kenya as well. It's something that you'll just never see any place else. It's amazing how you can get so close to the animals also on safari. Just don't get out of the car because lions will attack if you're out of the car. But one major misconception is that lions attack no matter what, and that's just not true. You have to remember that people have been doing safaris for so many years that these animals on the game reserves have been raised to see cars and people staring at them for years and years. So if you stay in the game drive vehicles and do what you're told, you will have the most amazing experience of your life. Looking forward to seeing the way the Maasai live and their cultures and different practices within the village. I've heard that they drink cow's blood and most of their time is spent herding their cows and goats around from place to place. 
The Maasai tribe is actually very interesting. They've had the same cultures and traditions for over hundreds of years. They greeted me with a tribal dance of welcome, and the women came out and the men with a chant. The men show their virility and strength through their unusually high jumping, and they perform this customary jumping, followed by a flirting ritual where they run up to the person they are interested in and then run back to jump some more. It's amazing to see how everyone works together to teach the children, run the village, and they all look so happy and content. The kids have very little to entertain themselves, but family time is the key here, which warms my heart. I love these people, and I'm so honored to be invited to their village. And I was even invited to stay the night in a hut to experience the real Maasai life. But I had dinner plans with some locals back in Nairobi, and this girl needed a shower. Well, you know I had a great time. Yeah. <laughs>
I'm trying to change that, and hopefully every nice American who sees this <laughs> will, uh, will see, see my point. We hope so, too. As we continued talking, it just brought home to me exactly why I'm here, and it totally validates the reasons that I always go beyond the tourist attractions. Talking to the locals always opens up the door to adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting here reflecting on my time in Kenya, I can't believe it's over. Each visit to a new place brings more awareness to the fact that we're not so different. From Bankslade to Jojo, the people in the Maasai tribe, the girls at the bar, and all the others that I've met, it's all about getting to know them and seeing life beyond the headlines. To find out about our next adventure and to take the Culture Club Challenge with me, please go to cultureclubshow.com.